Recently, the Pistons have gone on a 20-game losing streak. It seems everyone now is making fun of them. Even Spurs and Wizards fans are going, at least we aren't the Pistons. The Pistons have been a miserable team for the better part of most people's lives. But this wasn't always the case. So let's rewind. Back in the early 2000s, the Pistons were one of the most elite teams, always at the top of the conference and even winning a championship in 2004. Just like the Bucks today with Giannis. So what happened? How did it go so wrong for so long? Let's dive into the timeline and break down the reason why the Pistons have been stuck in decades of despair. Let's start in 2003. In 2003, the Pistons already start on a bad luck streak, being one pick away from getting the legendary LeBron James. Instead, the Pistons decided to skip on Chris Bosh, Dwayne Wade, and instead picking Darko Milicic, who only played 10 seasons and only three of them with the Pistons. And when looking at his stats per game, yeah. It wasn't that great, but it would work out the next year. In 2004, the Pistons would have a bit of success, winning the 2004 championship even against all odds. With a roster of Ben and Rashid Wallace, Richard Hamilton, Chauncey Billups, and Tayshaun Prince against the Lakers with Kobe, Shaq, Gary Payton, and Karl Malone in just five games. The team was seen as underdogs, lacking a huge superstar name to carry them, like Kobe, Shaq, or even the Pacers with Reggie Miller. They were just trying to play good basketball in the city of Detroit. This meant the team was just that, a team. They were all glued to each other and meshed so perfectly with team chemistry. They shared the ball and scored and didn't let anyone score on them and just wanted to get the job done together. The Pistons would try to ride this success into the next season, making it to the finals again. Everything seemed great like they were about to win another title and start a dynasty, until Bob Horry scored a three, ending it. They would ultimately lose to the Spurs, who would take the 2005 championship with their big three. It was hard fought and they lost in a game seven. However, this, right after they made it to the finals again, is where everything would start going wrong. After a failure in the finals, and Larry Brown looking at other coaching positions, the Pistons decided to fire him in favor of Flip Saunders, and they would continue to run their current roster. But they would barely win against the LeBron Cavs and then lose to the Miami Heat in the conference finals, against the Dwayne Wade that they didn't draft and the Shaq that they had just previously beaten. And on top of everything else, Ben Wallace's contract was ending. This is where the Pistons would make their first mistake. The Pistons did not place enough importance on Ben Wallace as they should have. Ben Wallace was coming off of three Defensive Player of the Years and was insistent to the coach that they practice more defense. Unfortunately, the Pistons didn't feel he was worth as much value anymore and decided to keep focusing on offense, thinking Ben Wallace lost some of his verticality, agility, and so on, offering him only 49 million. This may seem like a lot since we aren't millionaires, but the Bulls ended up offering him almost 25% more with 60 million where he ended up going and winning another Defensive Player of the Year. This seemed to be a good move, seeing as how the Bulls would ultimately lose in the playoffs to this same Pistons team. But the Pistons didn't have enough to make up for the defense lost by Wallace and lost the next round. 
Ben Wallace was the last piece of this defensive trifecta the team had of Prince, Billups, and Wallace, keeping teams under 100 points almost the entire season. And now, it was starting to crumble apart. The Pistons tried to use nearly acquired Nazir Muhammad and Chris Webber for the loss of Ben Wallace, and they more than kept up with his stats offensively, but no center that the Pistons brought in was able to match what Ben had defensively, and they got rid of Webber and Muhammad just a year later. The bigger problem was, while the Pistons were getting worse, the rest of the East was getting better. The Magic were able to get J.J. Redick in the draft and acquire Rashard Lewis in free agency, which both were big pieces to put around Dwight Howard. Al Horford and the Hawks made the playoffs, along with Chris Bosh and the Raptors. The Bulls would pick up Derrick Rose, who would become future MVP, and the Celtics would end up creating one of the first super teams with Ray Allen, Kevin Garnett, and Paul Pierce going on to win the championship that year. These improvements happening at the same time as the Pistons spiraling only proved to further the gap of talent. And so the Pistons needed to do something big. Something big and fast. So that's exactly what they tried to do. In 2008 to 2009, Dumar was so impatient with his team's inconsistency after winning the championship a few years ago that he hired a new coach yet again, with Michael Curry. Dumar also let everyone on the team know that they could be traded, feeding insecurity to everyone on the team. Curry was a very aggressive and disciplinary coach, which did not mesh well with the rest of the team. On top of this, the Pistons and Dumar decided to do something else big to shake things up. The Pistons meant what they said when they said everyone was expendable, trading away another key player in Chauncey Billups. Chauncey Billups had won finals MVP the year they won the championship and had cemented himself as a key part of the Pistons, both in the game and in the community. Remember at the start when I said that a huge part of the team's championship success was the team chemistry that they had? Chauncey was part of the glue that held all that together, and now he was gone. With him leaving, it was evident the Pistons were blowing the team up. Rashid Wallace and other players, as well as fans in the community, voiced out their disliking to this change, and how drastic it was to get rid of him. This would be the equivalent of the Spurs trading Tim Duncan, or the Bucks trading Giannis. As Dumar said, no one was truly safe. The reason for this was to try and get a superstar for the team in return, adding Allen Iverson to the roster. Some saw it as a good idea at the time. Some of you probably know who Allen Iverson is, as he was that big of a name in the NBA. Even Larry Brown, the old coach I mentioned that they fired, talked about how it was an excellent trade and would have worked out for the team. However. This was towards the end of AI's career, as he was already out of his prime, going from scoring 30 points a game to only about 19 a game. Again, comparing it to today's terms, this would be like a team trading for Harden and expecting Houston James Harden to play. Comparing the two players together, Iverson would get injured and continue to decline, while Chauncey Billups instead went on to win three more All-Star appearances. To add insult to injury on losing players, the Pistons were swept later that season by familiar faces on the Cavaliers, including LeBron James and that same Ben Wallace that they claimed wasn't important earlier. In the 2009-2010 season, the Iverson experiment only deteriorated. Iverson came back from an injury and was put on the bench, which Iverson, the fans, and the other players hated. Why trade your best player at the time with ton of accolades only to have the player you get in return be a bench warmer? Iverson said he would rather retire than come off the bench, with Dumar filling the requests and pulling the plug on him. This meant that the Pistons traded away one of their cornerstones and now had nothing to show for it in just over a year. 
the Pistons continued to devolve, losing team chemistry with their trades and Curry's berating coaching style, and consequently would miss the playoffs for the first time since 2001. Justifiably disappointed, the Pistons let go of Curry just a year later after he was hired and replaced him with John Kuster. Rashid Wallace, the last sense of defense and the center power the team had, would also leave this season for the Celtics that had previously won. However, it seemed the Pistons finally realized their mistake and decided to bring Ben Wallace back, but he had already started to decline just as Iverson did when they acquired him. The team would pick up Ben Gordon and Charlie Villanueva, both of which seemed to do pretty well scoring about 13 points a game each. The problem was, it was not enough. Both players chewed up about a third of the cap space that Chauncey Billups gave. Ben Gordon then had an ankle injury and ankle surgery during the season and was never the same player again. The team still only finished 27 and 55, full of aging and out of prime vets and underdeveloped young bench players. However, there was a light at the end of the tunnel as the Pistons were in the draft lottery for hope to redeem themselves over the past failed lottery picks. However, they would fumble this as well. The Pistons' direction seems to try to replace the center position they had been missing since both Wallace's left, selecting Greg Monroe with the seventh pick, passing on Gordon Hayward and Paul George. The problem was that the Pistons once again went in the opposite direction as Ben Wallace. Ben Wallace was a defensive player that was aggressive and got blocks. Greg Monroe, on the other hand, was reported to be a passive player with good offensive ability, but a less polished offense, being compared to a less athletic Lamar Odin. It appeared that the Pistons did not learn their lesson with the Allen Iverson experiment either, as the Pistons picked up Tracy McGrady with another chunk of their cap space with Tracy McGrady only averaging 8 points this season compared to his fantastic 22 in Houston and 28 in Orlando. Houston would prove to be another failed coach and problem for the team, as Hamilton growing more frustrated with his team's continued losses and poor decisions since the 2004 championship he was a part of, and he got in Houston's face at practice, cussing him out and yelling, calling him a failure and a glorified assistant coach, which wasn't exactly wrong. Kuster would not respond at practice, seeming as if he had kept his cool. However, this would prove to be the opposite, as Kuster would bench Hamilton for several months following the altercation. This made team chemistry and approval ratings from the fans drastically drop, as they were benching one of their only remaining All-Stars and pieces of the 2004 championship. Players began to not show up to practices or pre-games and protests, calling it a mutiny against their coach. In a game where Kuster was ejected, rather than being upset or defending their coach, they actually cheered and laughed Kuster all the way off of the court. In 2011 and 2012, the NBA would experience its own problems with the NBA lockout, with a few teams changing ownership, including the Hornets becoming the Pelicans in 2012, the Warriors being bought out by Peter Guber, Joshua Harris buying the 76ers, Robert Para buying the Grizzlies, and the Pistons would change owners to Tom Gores, whose first move as owner was actually a common sense one firing Kuster just a few days after gaining ownership. The team focused their eyes on the 2011 draft. Surely the third time was the charm, as they hoped for yet another chance. The team landed on Brandon Knight, which was an improvement in previous failed picks. Brandon Knight was and has been compared to Drew Holiday, with good ball handling and offensive playmaking and a good point guard that could add to the Pistons. But he had his own issues with a high turnover rate due to his ball handling and his dribble. Knight would not end up being the best pick they could have gotten either, passing up on Kawhi Leonard, Klay Thompson, Kemba Walker, 
Tobias Harris, and Jimmy Butler. And Brandon Knight would go on to be part of one of the biggest NBA posters of the modern era. Lawrence Frank went on to replace Kuster, who was the previous coach of the Nets. The Pistons, while adding new players, also got rid of one, waving Richard Hamilton for 11 million and having him go to the Bulls, just as Ben Wallace did previously. The team finished only 25 and 41 with six and seven game losing streaks scattered throughout their schedule and losing 20 of their first 24 games. Ben Wallace decided to retire at the end of the season with Ben Gordon, Greg Monroe, and Brandon Knight being the new faces of the team, all being added just within the span of a few recent years. Except that would also be short-lived, dumping Ben Gordon off to Charlotte and preparing for yet another draft. In 2012, the Pistons actually drafted well, drafting Chris Middleton and Andre Drummond. However, the team would lose out on Draymond Green Evan Fournier, and Jay Crowder. Despite the new rookies being decent, the team started the season on an eight-game losing streak, which set the tone for the rest of the season, going 29-53 and 53 due to low morale and a developing young team. The team then traded away the very final piece of their championship, with Prince leaving to Memphis. Andre Drummond seemed to continue to be the biggest glimmer of hope the Pistons had for a while, with the most win shares in recent team's history. The team hoped for more success in the draft yet again, where they missed out on some other well-known names once again. Picking Caldwell Pope over CJ McCollum, Stephen Adams, Rudy Gobert, and most notably, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Then we enter the 2013 to 2014 season, where the Pistons also made yet another coaching change, hiring Maurice Cheeks. During this season, I'd like to take you back to recall the $60 million that the Pistons originally refused to Ben Wallace. Well, Dumar instead would give $54 million to this guy, Josh Smith who only played a single season with Detroit before being traded again, having only a 26% three and three turnovers a game. With this roster, the floor was not spaced at all, and no one was able to pass it out for an easy bucket. Dumar luckily brought back Billups as a sign of good faith to the fans, but this was just for morale, as Chauncey was already 38 at this point and only putting up less than 4 points per game. Dumar then made another crazy move, deciding to trade Chris Middleton to the Bucks for Brandon Jennings. Brandon Jennings at the time was scoring more than Chris Middleton, but ultimately only had 4 playoff appearances his entire career, with no All-Stars, while Chris Middleton on the other hand Shortly after, Dumar made yet another coaching change, with him firing Cheeks and making the assistant head coach John Lawyer the stand-in head coach for the remaining season, having these last 32 games of the season as John's only games he was ever a head coach, and resulting in one of the shortest Wikipedia pages for an NBA coach I've ever seen. This marked the one last terrible move before Dumar exited as the executive. In the 2014 draft, the Pistons only had the 38th pick, so they can't get too much hate as they made the same mistake as every other team, passing on Jokic at 41 and instead picking Spencer Dinwiddie. In the 2014 to 2015 season, Stan Van Gundy would take over as executive and try to pull a Thanos. Fine. I'll do it myself. 
naming himself as the head coach just as Pop had done for the Spurs in the past. This made Van Gundy the 8th coach in just over a decade since the championship. Unfortunately, the team was seeing more fallout of having so many head coaches over the seasons, as the players and fans sensed the failure and instability of the roster and coaching changes. The front office and coaching changes only served to stunt the developing players' growth as their leadership and practices and development were steered in multiple different directions and focuses throughout these times. The team continued to be dysfunctional as they were a young roster with no true one goal in practice, as every time they blinked, there was a new guy telling them what to focus on. The team then picked up Reggie Jackson in a decent three-team trade, who went on to score 16 points per game for them. But hey, remember that guy that they paid $54 million? Yeah, he's gone now. Not even traded or anything. With a roster yet again filled with underdeveloped, dysfunctional, and uncertain players, the team went 32-50 and and again hoped for better success in the following draft. In 2015 though, as expected, the Pistons blew another lottery pick, selecting Stanley Johnson who averaged less than 20 points the entire time he was in the NBA. Any person on this draft would have been better. Miles Turner, Bobby Portis, Pat Connaughton, Cameron Payne, Kelly Oubre, Kevin Looney, Terry Rozier, and not to mention Devin Booker, just to name a handful. Anyone other than what they picked would have been better. However, the team actually saw a lot more success than they previously had. The team was moving in the right direction. Stan Van Gundy made the effort to focus on developing the talent they had, with Andre Drummond becoming the cornerstone center they needed, and Greg Monroe and KCP improving steadily as well. The Pistons also traded Brandon Jennings for a previous draft pick they missed out on that I mentioned, Tobias Harris. And so, the team made it back to the playoffs. Unfortunately, this hope was short-lived, as the team and fans let out a big sigh of disappointment seeing who they were facing. The same enemy that they had every year in the playoffs. <sighs> LeBron James. And to top it off, former first round pick Kyrie Irving alongside with him. This was the beginning of the era where everyone expected Cavs vs Warriors to continue for a long time. So as predicted, the Pistons were easily swept by the same people who would win the championship the following year. The team would also lose out on Greg Monroe to the Bucks, who it seems like the Pistons just love giving players to apparently. The 2015-2016 season, however, unfortunately started another era of downfall as Andre Drummond began to become more inconsistent and stagnant. Stanley Johnson was just as bad as I said before, and Reggie Jackson had a knee injury. Spencer Dinwiddie as well was also traded away. The team consequently would miss the playoffs yet again, but managed to finish with an over 500 win-loss for a change. In the following draft, they would take another no-name, Henry Ellenson, over Pascal Siakam and DeJounte Murray. Nothing too exciting happened for the 2016-2017 season, except, do I even need to say it at this point? They blew yet another draft, choosing Luke Kennard over Donovan Mitchell, Bam Adebayo, Jarrett Allen, and many others. The next season, in 2017 to 2018, the team moved stadiums. This wouldn't have been as big of an issue or as big in the timeline if the team had been developing consistently and steadily rather than changing rosters and coaches every single year. The team continued to have issues adjusting to the new home stadium as well as all the coaching and roster changes and of course did not develop well. To make it worse, Stan Van Gundy broke his promise to continue developing young players and instead tried to yet again fast track success just like the Allen Iverson experiment, 
by trading for Blake Griffin. In doing so though, the team had to give up Avery Bradley and Tobias Harris, who were both doing well for the team. The team also gave up draft picks they could have used, but let's be honest, they probably would have blown those anyway. In case you were wondering, the pick that they traded for became Miles Bridges, and the player that the Pistons got was Bruce Bowen, who, just like Chris Middleton, was another player that they would trade away that eventually would win a championship. The trade seemed to work as Blake Griffin was in his prime and averaged over 20 points, but the competition would prove to be too much yet again. As the East still had the LeBron Cavaliers, the Miami Heat, the new Kyrie Celtics, Lowry and DeRozan Raptors, Embiid 76ers, and so on. The team lost a lot of depth in this trade. In the right circumstances, this would have been a smart move, as it would have put the capstone on a team that was just a bit away from a championship. But that was not the Pistons. Blake Griffin just served to make the turd a bit shinier. This meant that the Pistons were putting almost $25 million into Griffin, a declining Drummond, and an injured Reggie Jackson missing the playoffs for a second year in a row. In the 2018-2019 season, the team was healthy, but underwent yet another executive and coaching change, with Dwayne Casey taking over as coach and Ed Stavansky as the executive. The team did well and made the playoffs with a even 500 record, with Blake Griffin averaging a staggering 24.5 points per game. However, this would be short-lived. Taking Blake Griffin was a gamble as the team was about to see. Shortly after, in 2019 to 2020, Blake Griffin would become injured and would require knee surgery, which was a consistent problem Blake Griffin had the entirety of his career. This 24.5 points per game would be nearly slashed in half to only 15. On the bright side, Derrick Rose was a free agent, which they signed as another big name to pick up the slack. But as it goes with the Pistons, it wasn't enough. Further into the 2019-2020 season is where we start to enter recent events. The team traded away Andre Drummond and Reggie Jackson, and the team went only 20-46, and 46, with their top three points per game players, Andre Drummond, only playing 46 games for them, and Blake and Kennard both playing sub-30 and sub-20 games. The Pistons acquired Jeremy Grant and Killian Hayes, of which weren't superstars, but still added something to this incomplete roster. Incomplete being the obvious word, as the team finished only 20 and 52. After the 2020 to 2021 season, the Pistons looked up as they drafted Cade Cunningham, who looked promising. Unfortunately, the rookie would become injured soon after, and DeAndre Jordan was signed to the team before almost immediately being waived afterwards. In 2021 to 2022, Cade returned and was off to a hot start. The team got Jalen Duran and Marvin Bagley III, which I predicted would elevate their game with the trio. They were able to win 23 games. The trio did play well together, however the rest of the team did not, as they finished 17 and 64 this season in 2022 to 2023. And that brings us to today, where the Pistons are only 4 games away as I record this from having the longest losing streak in NBA history currently held by the 2010 Cavs after losing LeBron, and the 76ers during their process era. Their schedule does not look optimistic as they will most likely break this record that no one wants to break, playing Milwaukee, the Hawks, the Jazz, and the Nets in their next five games. They trapped Azur Thompson, who seems to be a decent pick at number five. They made Monty Williams the head coach after his success with the Sun making the finals, but paid him far too much. 
Recently, Monty has been making a lot of questionable decisions and some humiliating quotes. Monty went on to say that he realizes he needs to space the floor and make it possible for him to set up teammates. This generates responses back with people saying things like, it only took him 20 losses to realize how to play basketball. Cade Cunningham's biggest strength and skill set is being a point guard, meaning facilitating the play, passing the ball out, and setting up the offense. But when this is your offense, and your coach literally admits that he doesn't know how to space the floor, that's kind of difficult. Even though the Pistons have lost over 20 straight, it seems that their success has been a little inconsistent this season. Yes, they've lost every game, so it seems like consistent losses, but look at the point difference. Some teams like the Cavs and the Bucks, they hold to only one or two points, but then other mediocre teams like the Wizards blow them out by 20. One of the biggest critiques of this season has also been Jaden Ivey coming off the bench in favor of Killian Hayes starting, despite Ivey breaking out this season and scoring more points with less minutes than Hayes. As I said, the Pistons play a few difficult seasons in the next few games, so they are on pace to break this unfortunate record unless things change up. But who knows, maybe they pull off a single miracle win. As I said, they held the Cavs and the Bucks to one point. But this season just adds to the timeline of failure the Pistons have dealt with for decades. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to let me know down in the comments as this video was a lot longer and a lot more effort than my usual videos as you may have guessed. So if you watched this far, please like, sub, share the video around and all that good stuff as it really does support me. And I will see you guys in the next one. Peace out. This, this is not okay. This needs to stop now.